Here's a great controller you can pick up for an even better price. We are one step closer to finally having a portable Xbox. Series finally getting her own game. The Witcher 4 is officially in the works. And we'll take a look at how GTA stacks up on the Series X versus the PS5. Let's discuss. So Rockstar has released a next-gen version of GTA 5 in order to hold people over until they finally release Grand Theft Auto 6. That's right, Grand Theft Auto 5 has now officially made an appearance on three generations of Xbox consoles. The 360, the Xbox One, and now the Xbox Series X and S. It's crazy to think about. I've talked about this in a previous video, but basically they separated the online portion from the single-player campaign. A lot of people I know don't care about the single-player campaign. When I was growing up, I didn't even know that Grand Theft Auto had a story. I thought it was just like you go around rampaging through the city and racking up your wanted meter. And of course, it came with all sorts of visual, graphical updates, performance mode, quality mode, performance ray tracing mode, all the standard upgrade stuff. Now, whenever something like this is released, a lot of people are asking, hey, how does this compare to how it runs on another platform? In this case, the Xbox Series X versus the PlayStation 5. And what it comes down to essentially is that Eurogamer says that it's a wash between the two, but I'm gonna highlight some key differences if you're interested. They say the trial of grasses takes away Witcher's ability to feel emotion. Kind of like people who watch my channel, but don't subscribe. Join me on the path. Subscribe now. So according to Eurogamer, the Xbox Series X boasts a slightly faster loading time. They say, as an example, loading into Trevor's trailer takes 20.76 seconds on the Xbox Series X, rising to 23.18 seconds on the PlayStation 5. Ha! Now, we all know that's not particularly fast, considering how fast other games have been loading. For example, Psychonauts 2, when I was playing through it, the loading times of that were like nothing. The loading screen would come up, and I would, it was like a split second before I was back into the game. But still, that's a pretty noticeable upgrade compared to the last-gen loading times, when it would sometimes take like two minutes almost to load into things. Apparently, the PlayStation 5 renders an additional shadow under cars, around foliage, and at characters' feet, whereas the Series X right now appears not to. So, I don't know if you're like really into shadows or something. That's something to consider when you're shopping around for, oh, what should I play GTA 5 on? The Series X or the PS5? But on the other end, apparently the cube map reflections across vehicles are of a higher quality on the Xbox Series X. Ha! Both of these consoles apparently take a hit whenever there's like a lot of action in the game, like a lot of explosions. In this article from Eurogamer, they talk about the Mr. Phillips mission and both consoles take a hit in their FPS uh, during the course of that mission. But according to this article, during the Mr. Phillips mission, the PS5 dips into like the 40 frames per second range, whereas the Xbox Series X dips a little bit but stays 50 and above. So again, these are all small nitpicky things. If you wanna go through the full list yourself, I have the article article down in the description below. But if you use any of this like in a console war situation, I think it's just, who cares, right? Me personally, if I'm not looking at it side by side, I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. Like for me, if you show me a game at 1080p, I'm like, whoa, that looks great. I'm not really like a graphic snob. I am getting a little bit more used to 60 frames per second now that I've been gaming on uh, my Xbox Series X versus when I was previously gaming on my Xbox One. But other than that, I'm not really like, oh, I'm not going through looking for like each individual shadow and like how the textures measure up between the two consoles. That's just not my thing. And Grand Theft Auto V, surprisingly, I feel like not a lot of people are playing this next gen version. I'm not seeing a lot of stuff about it on uh, social media and I don't really see a lot of people talking about it. I myself took to my Twitter and I asked people, hey, what's everyone playing? And I got 24 responses. Don't mean to brag. <laughs> no, I know that that's a very, very small portion size, but not anyone, not a single person said that they were playing GTA 5. A lot of people said they were playing Tunic, Guardians of the Galaxy. I got a couple of uh, the Arkham series, but from my very unofficial poll from my small portion of my gaming viewership, no one said that they were playing GTA 5. I just feel like there's a lot of open world games out there right now. And I feel like if you're playing an open world game, you're probably playing Elden Ring and you probably don't want to jump from Elden Ring once you finish that up to like, oh, let me jump into GTA 5. I know they're very different experiences but that's just my take. So if you've been following my channel for a while, you know that I'm a big fan of the fantasy genre, especially fantasy RPGs. And one of my favorite games of all time 
is The Witcher 3. <laughs> and us Witcher fans, on the 21st, we got some great news. We learned that they are indeed working on The Witcher 4. The Witcher account tweeted out this picture with a link that brings you to their website saying, we're happy to announce that the next installment in the Witcher series of video games is currently in development, kicking off a new saga for the franchise. This is an exciting moment as we've been moving from Red Engine to Unreal Engine 5, beginning a multi-year strategic partnership with Epic Games. It covers not only licensing, but technical development of Unreal Engine 5, as well as potential future versions of Unreal Engine were relevant, blah de blah 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 At this point, no further details regarding the game such as development and time frame and release date are available. So yeah, again, that's super exciting to hear. I was not sure whether they were going to continue the Witcher series. They were saying that this is our final Witcher game and then some other people were coming out saying, no, it's probably the last game where Geralt of Rivia is going to be the protagonist. So hearing this official announcement, I know it's probably years out, years and years and years out, especially since they're working with a new engine, but I'm still super, super excited to know that the series is continuing. And although we don't know too too much about the game. Obviously, they haven't even started development of it, or they're in the very early stages of it, of course. But the screenshot alone is pretty interesting once you kind of delve into it. So the Witcher medallion that we're all used to if you have played through the Witcher games is the medallion that belongs to the School of the Wolf. It's where Geralt of Rivia trained, studied under Vesemir with uh, all the other Witchers that appear in the game, like uh, Eskil, like Lambert, those guys. And that emblem for the School of the Wolf looks a lot like this. It is kind of like this ferocious, geometrical, kind of wolfy guy. But as you can see here in the screenshot, that is not the same emblem, the same medallion that you see on the medallion that Geralt of Rivia wears. It looks a lot more like a cat medallion. And that's interesting because for those who played the games, we know that there are different schools of witchers. So the one we're most familiar with is the school of the wolf, but we know there's a school of the cat, the school of the bear, school of the viper. But the school of the cat medallion, as we know it in the game, does not look like the screenshot that they shared. Shared. The medallion that we're used to is a lot more, I would say, flat. And this one kind of has like some pointy ears, kind of has a longer face, kind of like a, a wild cat, like a lynx or something like that. So a lot of people are debating about what exactly that means. So a lot of people are saying this has something to do with Siri, aka Cirilla, aka Zirael, the child of the elder blood. And although she was technically brought up by the school of the wolf, she wears a cat medallion on her waist in this third Witcher game. Blowing your mind with some Witcher lore. <laughs> Now, according to the books, Ciri apparently killed Guy from the School of the Cat and took his medallion for his, herself. So while we're not entirely sure what this medallion means, whether it's connected to the School of the Cat, we know that this game is going to be probably centered around Cirilla. I'm pretty sure CD Projekt Red said that Geralt is no longer going to be the protagonist. This is like the end of the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt was the end of his saga. And if you've played through Blood and Wine, the last DLC for the Witcher 3, I won't spoil it for anyone, but I'm just saying him no, no longer going out and going on Witcher adventures makes a lot of sense. But I can't imagine they won't involve him in The Witcher 4 in some way. We saw a lot of backlash over on The Last of Us 2 for reasons I will not get into. Joel was not a significant part of the story. So even if Geralt is not gonna be the main character, I can't, I, I assume that he's gonna have some sort of cameo, uh, something to do with the story. Now we don't know exactly what that story will entail for The Witcher 4, but I know a lot of people are excited for Ciri to have her moment, to be at the forefront, to be the main character of this game. She was super charming in The Witcher 3. She had a really awesome story. She had really cool powers as a child of the Elder Blood, as a possessor of the source. And now a lot of people were excited because they thought, oh, Siri, since she can travel to other worlds, she's gonna be in cyberpunk. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. That game was also made by CD Projekt Red. We're gonna have Siri in cyberpunk and it's gonna be awesome, but she was not in cyberpunk. Spoiler alert, I'm not sure if anyone <laughs> was still waiting for her to pop up in their cyberpunk playthrough, but she's not in cyberpunk. It is an interesting move that they're switching engines. I don't know, I'm sure that'll tack on a lot of time to the development process and how closely they're tied to Epic 
Games. I'm not sure how that's gonna go. They have confirmed already on Twitter that this game is not gonna be tied to the Epic Games Store as an exclusive deal. But how that partnership plays out, I'm not so sure. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, boo, The Witcher 4, who cares? CD Projekt Red, they don't have the sauce anymore because of Cyberpunk and how it launched and how disastrous that was. But I'm here to say Cyberpunk is a good game. And I think I'll get a lot of support for that. I like the next gen version of it. I like what I'm seeing so far from it. After I beat Elden Ring, I'll probably jump into that. So I'm excited for The Witcher 4 to see what they have in store for us. So last week I talked about how Microsoft made some improvements to your xCloud experience on iOS devices. But since then, Microsoft has been working on some other exciting things, working to bring cloud gaming to some places that you might not have expected. So in order to talk more about it, I brought my friend Jimmy Champagne, who runs a little channel called Deck Ready, to talk about it some more. Hello. <laughs> so Ray let me know that the iOS version of cloud gaming got an upgrade. I remember last time we checked it out, it was not running all that well. And recently Microsoft put out a tutorial to add cloud gaming to the Steam Deck as if it was an app in your Steam library. And and I was honestly pretty impressed with how it's performing. So I figured I'd come by and see how it's performing on the iPhone and then Ray can check it out here on the Steam Deck. Yeah, that looks cool, like right off the bat. Maybe you just have a cooler car, I don't know, but this looks great just looking at it right now. So here on the Steam Deck, the native resolution of this screen is 800p, but this version of cloud gaming, you have to do launch options to set it at 720p and then it upscales it by 1.25 times and looks pretty good to me honestly like the edges are a little bit rough and mm. there is a little bit like every minute or so you get a little stutter and of course because it's cloud streaming you've got just a little bit of latency but that's the thing I got used to the quickest and I'm wondering how this compares to this jawbone controller is that what that is uh, this is the backbone controller oh, how dare you jaw, jawbone, jawbone was like a bluetooth headset i think <laughs> when hell? i was in high school Holy crap. so yeah the backbone controller how does it perform with that so on the ios i'd say it's a uh, similar uh the resolution i'd say is a little bit lower than what you have on your steam deck uh, I experienced some stutters as well, but it's not nearly to the level that I was experiencing even just a couple of weeks ago trying to play Forza on cloud gaming. Prior to this update, I would say there was like, what's the official word to when like, it's not only a stutter, but there's like a pixelated, like there's cubes oh. going on almost. I got that a I lot. I just call it like a blocky texture. Yeah, there's I don't like, know what the official word is. There was for like that. a blocky texture going on a lot when I tried playing this game on the cloud prior to this update. And there's none of that so far. And Jimmy can confirm the Wi Fi in here is not that great. So we're running on like pretty low power Wi Fi and it's still doing pretty well. I'm impressed. And we're both streaming the same game at the same time. And I'll also point out, I set this up at my house over the week. Weekend, and my Wi-Fi at home is worse than the Wi-Fi here and it's working better here but it still worked just fine at home. So what's exciting to me about this is that Microsoft worked directly with Valve to bring cloud streaming to the Steam Deck. What do you think that means for the future in terms of maybe getting Game Pass natively on the Steam Deck? I would love to have Game Pass natively. I think they can make it happen because Valve has said multiple times that like all it takes is an email to get this stuff working. This feels like a stopgap for in between to see how many people actually use the cloud streaming. I'm sure if they get enough pushback, they'll port natively the Xbox app there is a workaround right like i could go buy forza horizon 5 on steam the issue is you lose right. cross save when you use the steam version of forza horizon 5 some games have cross save with xbox series x some games don't also i could just install windows on here but that's kind of a pain so this honestly right now feels like a great workaround to get access to game pass ultimate you want to so try it out Absolutely. So yeah, I got the <laughs> iPhone. That's an iPhone 13, not the Max, not the Max Pro, just the base model. It runs pretty decently. I'm gonna give it a try on OK. Dude, this is way better than the last time we tried it. I remember when we tried Halo in an Xbox Ready video and it was no. not, I wouldn't call it playable. <laughs> no, 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 no. I could barely get through like the weapon drills on Halo, let alone like a full match. But this is, I'm impressed with this. And with the like the heft, of the controllers and the grip on the Steam Deck. This is like really, really cool. Compare, I mean, these little controllers, the Backbone, the Razer Kishi, they're great for your iPhone, but the, you can't beat like the meat of <laughs> what the Steam Deck has got going on right here. I'm a little biased, but I'm, I'm gonna be real. I do still prefer the Steam Deck, but this is playable now and it is much better than it was the last time we checked it out. The Steam Deck, I gotta say, I'm 
coasting through Mexico right now and it is super, super smooth. I'm not picking up as much latency compared to the iPhone, I would say. And I just ran into a building as I said that. So <laughs> that wasn't as smooth, but still pretty smooth running into that building, I gotta say. I am impressed with like with the reflections off of the car and the like the way the light like shimmers and shines on the car as you're driving around. That, that detail is like pretty well represented, uh, especially when you take into account this is being streamed and not being played natively on the Steam Deck. Yeah, it looks like the ray tracing is activated. And even if you were playing this natively on the Steam Deck, you would have to probably use medium low settings to get a full 60 frames per second. Obviously you could bump it up higher to get 30 frames per second, but I don't know if you could lower the settings enough to be able to use ray tracing. So that's cool. You're basically getting it maxed out in Series X format on the Steam Deck. Yeah, I gotta say there is a little bit of stuttering, but it's nothing too egregious to where I'd be like, man, I can't play this game. And as we all know, streaming right now is capped out at 1080p. And honestly, although we all want 4K to be available for streaming, I'm pretty pleased with this. So if you have a Steam Deck, this is a great workaround if you wanna have access to your Xbox Game Pass Ultimate games. But as we all know, the Steam Deck, it's kind of hard to get your hands on right now. A lot of people, they're getting their pre-orders pushed back to like quarter three, quarter four, 2023. So this is a hot ticket item right now. But I feel like if you were to pick up one of these controllers, the Backbone, the Kishi, and pair it up with your iOS device, you're gonna have a pretty solid experience. What do you think? Yeah, this is this is working totally fine. If you tried iOS streaming in the past and weren't a big fan of it, I would give it another shot because this is working way better. I'm gonna head out, but if you wanna see more videos all about the Steam Deck, make sure you check out the channel Deck Ready. We'll have it linked down in the description. Can I have my Steam Deck back? Yeah, you can here, take that you, back. you take your iPhone. I'm just gonna take this back and head over here and play more Forza Horizon. Uh... So as gamers, we all love controllers, right? It's part of our identity. We have our favorite controller that we use, whether because we like the look of it, whether uh, because the functionality fits our specific needs. It's a controller that we play with, and then we give you know, the people that are coming over to play co-op games the other controller that you don't like so much. You have that special controller just for yourself. For me, primarily, I use the Xbox 20th Anniversary Edition. I really like the look of it. I like the grips that it has on the back. It is just generally just my go-to. But there are some limits to it, right? It's just the base Xbox controller. And a lot of people are realizing is that they need a pro controller. They need a controller with the back paddles. They need a controller with trigger resistance. They need all sorts of stuff. So one of the main advantages of having a pro controller, a controller with paddles, a controller with extra buttons, and a game like Elden Ring, for example, is that you can remap very important functions to those extra buttons so you never have to take your fingers off the analog sticks. So using this as an example, my backbone controller, if you want to dodge roll an Elden Ring, that's B, right? But in order to do that, you have to migrate your thumb off of the stick and then roll like that. Whereas a, a pro controller with paddles on the back, you can still be rolling and moving, all that good stuff. The problem with pro controllers though, and controllers like that, is that they're pretty freaking expensive, right? The Xbox pro controller right now, the V2, is like 200 plus dollars, and that's like the price of a Series S, man. That's a lot of money, that's a big investment. So if you are looking for a controller to elevate your gaming experience, to really get good, I highly suggest that you check out the Razer Wolverine V2. It is perhaps one of the cheapest controllers out there that will serve sort of as a pro controller, not really, but sort of as a pro controller. It has a lot of the same features. It is usually priced at $100 right now, but it's on sale for $60, which is not, that's like the price of a regular Xbox controller. The last time this controller was $60 was back in November, back in the holiday time. So it's been like, what, five months since then? And you don't wanna have this deal pass you by and then wait another five, six months to potentially pick it up if it goes on sale again. Now, I personally don't own this controller, my friend Matt does, but I think this represents a pretty substantial upgrade over the standard Xbox controller, and it's the same price with the sale going on right now, $60. Sometimes a regular Xbox controller, if you trick it out and you know customize it with different colors and stuff, it'll go up to $70, so some, it's in some cases cheaper than the standard controller. Now, if you're still not sold on the Wolverine controller for whatever reason, I think it's probably the cheapest controller I've covered since the 8-bit Doe controller 
controller that I talked about last week. The Xbox Elite Series 2 controller is on sale right now. It's usually $180, but right now it's on sale for $140. So there's a little bit of savings to be had if you wanna go for the official Xbox Pro controller. Although some people have been reaching out to me on Twitter saying that it breaks easily, especially the magnetic pads on the back. I don't know the validity of those claims. I personally have not had any trouble with mine, but that's something to keep in mind. Some people have been reaching out to me and saying that it's a little bit fragile. 